idea of owning land, an old notion forged by the sword, is quietly undergoing a profound transformation. However natural owning land may seem in our culture, in the long sweep of human existence, it is a fairly recent invention. Where did this notion come from? What does it really mean to own land? Why do we, in our culture, allow a person to draw lines in the dirt and then have almost complete control over what goes on inside those boundaries? What are the advantages, the disadvantages, and the alternatives? How might a humane and sustainable culture reinvent the ownership connection between people and the land? Good day. This is Nation in Conversation. We welcome you from the Forum Harmony in the Cradle of Humankind. Land reform remains a contentious issue. Today's discussion focuses on the history of land ownership around the world, as well as the current financial models on the table. Remember to join us in the conversation on Twitter at Nation Converse. I welcome with me in the studio Jackie Grobler, Senior Lecturer in History, University of Pretoria, and Pierre Fenter, General Manager of the Banking Association of South Africa. Jackie, I would like to start the first part of the conversation with you. Land ownership in the history of land ownership. It's got a long history with various factors playing a role. What is that history? Well, to put it in a nutshell, Theo, uh, human history has been impacted upon by forces outside the normal uh, scope of, of, of human control forces that developed over many, many millennia. And uh, individuals, even very prominent rulers, could hardly change the course of what happened. Neither communities. Uh, now, the stadia that land ownership went through uh, can be divided into four. In the archaic um, form of human life, there was no concept of land ownership. Uh, people just sort of existed and struggled to survive, to find food uh, every day. It's impossible to say exactly when, but uh, 20 or 30,000 years ago, human beings started to organize themselves into groups uh, and they hunted together uh, in a controlled fashion. Uh, and uh, that was when the first time they demarcated in a way territories, but with no fixed borders, of course, uh, because there was no concept of a border. Um, it was just, or a frontier even, uh, it was like animals today in the wild. Uh, some animals have their territories, like a pride of lions or a leopard, leopards and so forth. Now, in these days, uh, it was very um, flexible, the whole system. But third stage entered when human beings started cultivating the land and it necessitated control over specific areas where cultivation took place, where food was produced. And more food than a single human being could uh, use. So food became uh, something that could be sold, something that could earn an income, and of course, people would protect uh, their, their resources. They were capital land. investing. Yeah, uh, uh, human capital, yeah, uh, like labor. And the labor of your laborers if you uh, owned slaves or hired people. Uh, now, this stadium, stadi uh, stadium in the history of land ownership uh, went on for a long time and was slowly replaced by the concept of private ownership, which was introduced around two, two millennia ago. That's 2,000 years 2000 ago. 2,000 years ago, as far as we know, initially in the Roman Empire, uh, where uh, in their statutes, the whole concept of private property was for the first time um, coded. And land was one of the um, resources that could be privately owned. That put a value on land, but it also made it transferable. You can, you can pledge it as surety, and it became somebody's ownership. Yeah, yeah. Now, this, uh, again, it took another thousand or more years before a land became 
a, a real capital resource. Uh, with the introduction of capitalism in uh, Western Europe. And the capitalism and land ownership went hand in hand. Uh, you cannot imagine capitalism without land ownership and the other way around. Let's jump a few decades later. There's been various big policies in certain countries to, change, to try to change this dynamic. Can you elaborate on some of these major uh, policies that try to change this? Yeah, uh, the problem was that uh, large segments of the population were excluded from land ownership. And of course, they resisted this. They um, questioned the right of especially the wealthy to own all the land. And uh, programs were instituted. First, um, theories were developed, uh, for example, by Karl Marx, and then in some countries, programs instituted to change the whole system of land ownership. Uh, and the first major attempt took place when the Soviet Union was established uh, from 1917 with the uh, revolution, uh, the communist revolution in Russia. And, the, uh, the, and in terms of um, Marxism, Leninism, collectivization of land took place and the land was uh, distributed amongst the population, but without private ownership. The same happened in China uh, under uh, Mao Zedong. The same happened in Cambodia uh, about 50 years later in the 1970s with the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot. And in all cases, private ownership was totally abolished. In all these cases, it went hand in hand with traumatic results. Um, huge loss of life because of uh, uh, a decline in production of food. And uh, starvation uh, was, was the result. The lesson we can learn from this is that to try to change the forces of history overnight can uh, lead to a calamity. And the cost of that is not worth the principle. If, if social engineering is driven too far, definitely not. After the break, we will talk about the history of land in South Africa and then start to focus on the security of tenure and why it's important for the current financial model in the agriculture sector. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Today's discussion focuses on the history of land reform around the world as well as the current financial models on the table. With me in the studio is Jackie Grobler from the University of Pretoria and Pierre Fenter from the Banking Association of South Africa. Jackie, we talked about the history internationally and some of their programs to change land ownership. Let's get to South Africa, our history in terms of land and land ownership. Can you take us through that? When the first Dutch settlers permanently settled in South Africa, at that time, uh, the, there was no private land ownership in South Africa. The Khoi people, the Sun people, and uh, the uh, Bantu-speaking peoples had communal land ownership. If there was a concept of land ownership, which was actually foreign to the culture and to the languages of those communities. But the Dutch came from a European background and they introduced the European culture here. And very quickly, uh, the Dutch East India Company, which in theory owned the colony, uh, allowed some of its um, employees to become so-called free burghers. And they were granted land on which they could farm for a profit. But they had to sell all their produce to the Dutch East India Company. Now, this concept spread. Uh, of private ownership spread into the interior, uh, but uh, still the Dutch East India Company owned the land. It was after the British took over the Cape uh, permanently in 1806 that British laws were introduced and private land ownership with title deeds uh, became the norm. But the problem was that, of course, for the uh, British authorities, the problem was that uh, there was resistance to this from the local communities. 
it resulted in what I always called our first 200 years wars in South Africa. Firstly, between the Dutch and the Khoisan, and secondly, between the Dutch and then also the British and the Khoza uh, speaking peoples on the so called Eastern frontier of the Cape. Now, this resistance went on, but because the colonial powers were stronger and even the new colonial uh, powers like the Buri publics uh, were stronger than the local communities, the European concept uh, be became the norm over the whole of South Africa by 1902, at the end of the anglo Boer War. It was then that uh, the concept of reserves were introduced, the concept of locations were introduced, and South Africa became, to a large extent, a white man's country, uh, especially as far as land ownership went. From a financial point of view, and I'm talking purely from a financial point of view, if I look at the current agriculture landscape, the total debt of the farming community is around 120, 125 billion rand. That debt is based on the premise that the borrower has security of tenure as a producing entity, and therefore the banks can lend into that entity. Why is that security of tenure so important? Okay, before I go there, Theo, I just want to go back to your point made about private ownership and the banking sector's exposure to private ownership in South Africa. Our exposure is somewhere in the region of 2.3 trillion rand. So it's absolutely critical for us that property, private property... That's in total... Do own your exposure to private property. So it's absolutely critical that private ownership and the rights that go with such ownership continue to exist in our country. Otherwise, if it goes down, the, the financial system will go, go down. It will create systemic risk for us. We'll go move on to, to agriculture. Yes, our exposure is, is just over in excess of 100 billion rand. A lot of that exposure is premised on us being able to rely on the property as security for the loans that we give out. Now, where does the money come from for a bank to lend money to whatever sector in, in our economy? It's people's deposits that we lend. It's your and my salaries, our excess money that we leave in the bank, and the bank lends a major portion of that uh, in, in the form of loans. The shareholders, essentially their capital that they introduce really provides the infrastructure for a bank. So it's depositors' money that is lent, and, and we have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we lend that money safely, because if we don't lend it safely, a bank will go bankrupt. And we saw that a couple of years ago with, with African Bank. Banks are a lot more sensitive than what uh, people perceive they are. I think South Africans are spoiled in that respect. In 2007, 2008, some of the biggest banks in the whole world needed to be bailed out by government money, by tax base. Even today, some of the bigger banks in the UK and in Europe is owned by the state. Absolutely. We never bought that bullet. No, we didn't. And, and, and what was the reason for that? Good management and our banks were well capitalized. What we also did is we lent prudently. What you had is a, a, what I would call a party where money was lent injudiciously and they weren't able to get it back. And uh, the bankers, they have to bear a major portion of the, of the blame for, for that imprudent lending. So, so am I right in deducting that should a bank or the banking institution start to favour a specific sector for reasons other than commercial? When we talk about systemic risk, that means we put the whole banking system at risk, and that is not something one would like to do. Absolutely. I'd just like to take it back a step here. If you look at um, a, a, a regulatory framework called Basel, um, it basically regulates how banks lend throughout the world. And South Africa, as part of the G20, we adopt that Basel framework. And they're now in the third version of Basel because the second version still left holes in the manner in which banks left, and that's what caused some of the 2008 crisis. So they've now put in additional safeguards to make sure that banks' depositors' funds are actually safe. South Africa's adopted that Basel III framework. We're actually in the process of implementing it at the moment, and we are compelled in terms of our local legislation called the Banks Act 
to actually lend to a, a firm set of criteria, part of which is uh, that we will not as far as property is concerned, that we lend based on, on the market value of that property. When we come back, Pierre, I would like to talk about the current proposals on the table and how the banking system would like to play, play a role within the realm of sound financial management. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. We continue our discussion around land reform. With me in the studio, Jackie Grobler from the University of Pretoria and Pierre Venter from the Banking Association of South Africa. Pierre, I would like to focus on the current proposals on the table. Let's start with the principles of these proposals and what does the Banking Association offer? Yeah, I think firstly one needs to recognize that land reform in our country must be successful. And as the banking sector, we can help shape the future of our country. We, we can't do it alone. We need government to play a role where it needs to play a role, but we can certainly help shape the future of our country. And given the importance of land reform and the fact that we have to get it right in our country, we, what we did is when uh, the Department of Rural Development put forward its model called Strengthening the Relative Rights of Those That Work the Land, the so-called 50-50 model, we recognized a couple of flaws in that. Firstly, it would result in the division of land, which would make a lot of the farms uneconomic and unviable. It also was unconstitutional and it would result in conflict, and uh, which is a horrible road to go down. So we sat around the table for many months and toiled on creating a model which is an alternative to that model where the private sector embarks on land reform on a voluntary basis. And it requires the cooperation of the farmers themselves, where they have a vested stake. Um, it requires the involvement of financiers. It also requires the involvement of laborers, because everybody needs to have some skin in the game. And our model is premised on that. It's premised on additionality, where a farmer would, a, a commercial farmer, would acquire a, a, a piece of land located, or a commercial farm located in close proximity to the existing farm. We wanted to see proper transformation, so we are looking for at least 50% ownership of that additional farm that's acquired to actually pass to black beneficiaries. And those black beneficiaries may well be the farm's laborers. The, those black beneficiaries in terms of our model would be financed by with a capital grant from from government but the farmer himself would actually take out a mortgage loan for his 50 percent cost of the the acquisition of that farm he's at risk the community or the beneficiaries are at risk because if that venture fails they will lose what they, they they've just been awarded by by government and then obviously financiers lose as well uh, because our, our money is at risk, our capital that we've actually lent to the commercial farmer. But I think the big benefit to that is the fact that a farmer is able to choose beneficiaries that are passionate about farming, that he believes are good partners that are going to make a successful and, and commercially viable, sustainable venture out of, uh, out of the, their partnership, number one. And number two, he gets additionality because he's now acquired an additional piece of land. He owns 50% of that land. So, of course, he leverages off his existing infrastructure. He gets economies of scale and so on. And given the fact that we're in an import-export parity market with no protection to farmers, the cost of getting production costs down and critical mass up is of absolute paramount importance. So we believe it's a win-win uh, model for everyone. What we have done, Theo, and... and, and we have made a commitment of a billion rand, and it's us, the proud commercial banks, in partnership with the agri-business chamber lenders, have made a commitment of a billion rand a year for the next 15 years. Now, we didn't suck that, that number out of the, the, the sky. What we basically did is we looked at our national development plan, which is, and, and our model is aligned to that plan, if with that form of commitment from the from private sector lenders, what will happen is that will result in 20% of commercially viable farms being transferred to black beneficiaries. So that transformation will occur in an orderly and, and viable manner. And that, that billion rand a year for 15 years, that will adhere to banks' credit policies, 
prudent regulatory framework and will be in the course of normal commercial viable business? It will. Um, we believe that something like this should be of a competitive nature so the, so the lenders would compete against each other for this business. Um, it would be premised on commercial principles so the, the lender would actually make the financial credit decision to actually lend to that that or that farm that's been acquired and that's premised purely on on, on, on commercial viability. Jackie, South Africa has a 10-year window where we can have rational discussions, proper plans and proper implementation. If we cannot get land reform and the and the accommodating new farmers into the system in this 15 years, the debate could go into the hands of the irrational activities. Well, that means that we are not seeing commercial land invasions now, but if in 15 years time we haven't addressed this, or in 10 years time we haven't addressed this, it's going to become an emotional debate. And we run the risk of, of, of radical elements starting to, to form part of the debate, which is not where we want to be. You've said that in a lot of cases, the, these land restitution or land, uh, or land uh, redistribution policies did not work. It was a big cost to government. But on the other hand, we cannot not do it. Where are we in this? Well, in the same way that uh, we learn from history that uh, social engineering normally fails, we also learn from history that if the expectations of peoples are not met, they would resist and they would not shy away from using violence to uh, accomplish what they, what they dream uh, should be the case. In our constitution, uh, the injustices of the past is condemned, is recognized, and uh, the uh, transformation is part of our government policy. If transformation produces nothing, if the injustices of the past are not wiped out, to a certain extent at least, um, and in a way expectations are not met, we're going to have trouble in South Africa, like um, the uh, situation in Zimbabwe even. Um, but on the other hand, we learn from history that if land reform is not done responsibly, uh, it could have traumatic impact, not only on the government, but on the people of South Africa as a well. whole. Pierre, in terms of your interaction with the agriculture sector, with the agribusiness sector, with the farming community and with government, are we on the right track? I think we are. Yeah, I think it's a tough road. I think there are different voices um, talking, some of which are radical, as Jackie was, was uh, talking, you were alluding to just now. But I do think that people recognize, and I think everyone recognizes, the importance of us getting land reform correct. I think what we need to do as a country, though, is we're wonderful with creating plans. We now need to start implementing those plans. And our frustration is, is that we've put our model on the table. We've would like to start implementing that model as soon as possible on, on pilot projects. We can um, make slight changes to the model to get it before we go out on scale, but we, n we now need to get it to get going. That is a model aimed at the commercial farmer. Absolutely. Would you also look at a model where you include the more traditional um, communal farming areas? Absolutely. So I think. If you go back to when we introduced the model to the minister and his executive some months ago, one of the points we made is that this model is premised purely on commercial farming sector. And there are a number of other important sectors that have to work in the agricultural space. Sub-commercial, small holders, communal farmers, and, and so on. And we are going to need to create alternative models which will be quite different to the one that is currently on the table for the commercial sector for each of those segments. I think what is important is that we need to segment what it is that needs to be done uh, as far as agriculture is concerned, the different groupings of agriculture in South Africa is concerned, and then develop a model for that that will achieve the outcome that, that will, will make it successful.
Jackie, you talked about forces and you talked about things that individuals or communities cannot really influence. Are you positive about the future of agriculture in South Africa? Well, we have no choice. We have to be positive. And if um, uh, models like uh, the one that is proposed by Peer is introduced in a responsible way, I have no doubt it can be successful. Any model to work will need to be implemented on a rational basis. Otherwise, there's risks. Uh, we, we have to um, show a measure of emotional intelligence in South Africa uh, that is almost um, uh, impossible to achieve. But I believe we can do it. Well, we showed it in 1994, and this is the challenge to do it again. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking part in the conversation. Visit our website, nationinconversation.co.za, and follow us on Twitter at Nation Converse. Please join us again when we continue with our conversations. From me, Theo Foster, goodbye. Making it better No matter